are very different. We're here this evening with researcher and conservationist Jonathan Slatt to talk about his book, Owls of the Eastern Ice, a quest to find and save the world's largest owl, the blackest and fish owl, which is almost two feet tall and has a wingspan of six feet. Slatt takes us to Eastern Russia where we join his small team for late night monitoring miss missions, mad dashes across thawing rivers, drink vodka with mystics, hermits and scientists, and listen to fireside tales of the Amur Tigers. So with a nod to Russia, I'm toasting these magnificent birds with, I'm sorry, a nice Vermont vodka. What is everybody else drinking? I like how this is the multiple choice. <laughs> I'm drinking a, a spindrift. <laughs> I'm saving the alcohol okay. for later. <laughs> okay, well, that all looks good. Um, So Jonathan Slatt is the Russia and Northeast Asia coordinator for the Wildlife Conservation Society. He manages research projects involving endangered species such as the blackest and fish owl and the Amur tigers and coordinates the WCS avian conservation activities along the East Asia, Australia Asian flyway from the Arctic to the tropics. He received a BA in, from Drew University and an MS and PhD from the University of Minnesota. John is considered to be one of the world's foremost experts on the blackest and fish owl, which is the subject of his new book, Owls of the Eastern Ice, a New York Times 2020 notable book. And it was long listed for the National Book Award. Charles Radigan will be joining us with John. Charles is the executive director of the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, VINS, an environmental education and research and avian rehabilitation organization in Queechy, Vermont. He's an award-winning producer, director, writer of film and video with an MFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology School of Imaging Arts. He was nominated for an Emmy and is the winner of three Telly Awards and his work has appeared on PBS, ESPN, and Nat Geo. Welcome, John and Charles. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Uh, so Sandy, should we start? Yes. All right. Did you get the survey done of the, uh, of the alcohol? Will we be? We're all set. We're all set. Will you be sharing that uh, later? Uh, we already did. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. Uh, John, it's great to be able to, to speak with you. I, uh, I have to say I enjoyed reading uh, this book tremendously, not only for my interest in birds generally, but uh, uh, Vins, uh, where I work, has a specific uh, affinity for owls. Um, so I suspect that you had some choices as to what your research might uh, be as you embarked on uh, your PhD study. Can you, you know, maybe just tell us what, uh, what led you uh, down this uh, path? Sure, um, and, and also quickly, thanks to the Brattleboro Literary Festival for, for hosting this, this talk between me and Charlie. Um, so in, in about 2005, I, I just finished up a, a master's degree program. Um, I, had, I had studied songbirds in, in Primoria, so the, you know, the same part of the world where I ended up uh, working with fish owls. And uh, you know, I'd really struggled to, uh, to raise funds for, for that work, for, for the songbird work. It was just, you know, I'm, I'm a graduate student. I mean, I'm writing these small grant proposals, trying to, trying to generate interest in, in, in these unknowns or these poorly known birds on the other side of the world. And it was really hard. 
And so I decided like, you know what? I still want to keep working with birds in this region. I, I, I speak Russian, um, I have local contacts, but I want it to be easier. I, want it, I, I don't want to be so hard to, to raise funds just to, do, just to do my basic work. And so I, 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 I was trying to figure out which, uh, which bird species uh, needed conservation attention, like which birds were unknown, um, uh, but needed some kind of support, but then also which birds, which species were charismatic enough that it would be easier uh, to, uh, to fund the work. And so I, I really narrowed it down to, to two species. Um, the, the Blackson's fish owl was one. Um, the other was, is a crane species called the hooded crane, which is a, a small crane, a little smaller than a, than a um, sandhill crane, if you, if you know those here in North America. Um, and um, uh, as, as I'm you know, deliberating this in my, in my mind, I was, I was, I was traveling with a, with a friend near Pimoria. We were you know, hiking across this, this, um, this mountain um, divide and crossing this large bog. It was a 40 kilometer hike through this, through this large bog in summer. And it was just, you know, terribly, terribly bright. Uh, you know, the sun's beating down, there's no shade, it's these spindly larches. And it's this, uh, it's this bog, right? It's this, it's this hummocky bog. And so you really have to walk carefully. I mean, there's sort of these game trails that we're following, but it's, a lot of it is, is you know, kind of jumping from one grassy hummock to the next. And if you, if you slip a little bit, you know, you're, you're down to your knee or even higher and there's this like yeah. stinky, stinky mud. Uh, and the whole time there's, there's a cloud of uh, uh, biting insects that's like kind of on your trails that like, you know, caught your scent and they're trying to, with their little wings, trying, trying to keep up uh, to catch up to you. But you're, you know, you're able to stay ahead of them as long as you're, you're keeping a good pace. But anytime I'd stop and like, all right, uh, you know, which way do I go? Like which, which grassy uh, hummock do I jump to, left, right, or straight? The, this cloud would kind of catch up and envelop Felt my head and you know bite my eyelids and my mouth and my ears. It was just just a nightmare. And so as I'm sort of recovering from this trip, um, you know my my face, you know, parts of my face are still swollen. Uh, it occurs to me that that's exactly where the hooded cranes breed. Like they they breed in these <laughs> uh, remote, difficult to reach larch box. And so th that essentially made the decision for me. Like I'd much rather be up all night. Uh, in a Russian winter chasing owls than fighting my way through through large bogs um, yeah. chasing chasing the hood and crane. So I, I, I recognize that that's not a very romantic answer. It's a very pragmatic one, but that's really how I made my decision to, to study the fish owl. So could you uh, give us the context of the time uh, when you began um, and maybe a quick chronology before we get into a, a little bit more specifics? Uh, with, with respect to to the project, yes, to the project. When you, you made your decision to go ahead and and do this, uh, you must have had to, you know, do preparation, grant yep. writing, whatever, and then plan your trip. And then you worked over successive seasons. And uh, part of the magic of the book is the development of your experiences over those seasons. And I think it would be helpful for people to understand the time frame. Yeah, sure. Uh, which yeah, so it was, right, it was summer, uh, I guess it was no, summer 2004, where I kind of decided that it would be, there would be the fish owl. Um, and then um, as I transitioned over the next year, uh, finishing up the master's and then starting the PhD, uh, I spent that time tapping into my, my network of local contacts in, in, in Russia. Um, there's, there's, there's essentially this one person in, in Russia who had experience with fish owls who was studying these birds. Uh, There's a Russian ornithologist named Sergei Surmich. And um, he worked closely with his, his brother-in-law, Sergei Abdeyuk. And the, the two of these guys um, had spent about, a, about 10 years uh, prior to my involvement looking for finding fish owls and putting together little pieces of, uh, of knowledge about them. And so I had encountered Surmich in the past. So I, I you know, set up a meeting with him and said, hey, what do you think? Do, do, can, do you want to collaborate on this project? Because, you know, I, I don't know where to find fish owls. You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't, I can't even be, you know, I can't, you can't just, unless you know things about birds, you can't really just walk randomly through the forest and thinking you're going to find one. And so um, I uh, made an agreement with, with Sormich where you know, he would provide uh, local knowledge, local expertise. Uh, he would help put together uh, he would handle most of the logistics, you know, putting together you know, field crews, uh, the, the, the equipment we needed. And I would bring um, some uh, new scientific methods and, and raise, raise, the, raise funding, write grants um, to, uh, to put this together. And so the idea really was to, I mean, so little was known about 
fish owls. Uh, but one thing we did know was that there was an intensive amount of new pressure, uh, uh, resource extraction pressure on what was thought to be some of, some of the, uh, the best habitat for these birds. So a lot of logging roads going in, a lot of fish being, uh, being harvested unsustainably. And so um, this was sort of the genesis of the project. The idea was to learn what we could about, about these birds. So, so that brings me to you know, the goal uh, of the research. What, uh, when you began, uh, what, what, what did you want to accomplish? Yeah, so what we wanted to do was really understand what it, it was, it's called you know, uh, resource selection or habitat selection. Just like understanding of, you know, a basic understanding of how a species interacts with this, with this environment. Like what parts of the landscape are important? Uh, is this a bird that uh, has to be, uh, it needs rivers to survive. It needs, like what kind of trees does it need? Um, how far away from human or how close to human settlements can it live? I mean, there's some species who, I mean, if, if they if they look at a human, they faint and go extinct. Uh, but you know, other ones are much more uh, much more tolerant and can live in close, close proximity. And so, in order to develop a conservation plan, in order to have an idea um, of what these birds need that we, that we can then share with the government or with uh, with, with loggers, you know, industry, until we have that idea, I mean, uh, we don't know how what they're doing impacts impacts the birds. So that was the goal to kind of develop this conservation plan. So um, did you have a sense of the kind of data that, that you would need it in order to be able to do that? Uh, yes, uh, we, you know, so some species you can observe directly. Uh, it, it's much easier. Um, you, you can just sort of watch them and see what they do and get a sense of, of what they need. Uh, other species, uh, it's, it's much more difficult. So things like, um, you know, tigers and more tigers have you know, uh, males have 1,400 kilometer square kilometer home ranges, right? So if you want to actually understand how that animal is interacting with the landscape, and that's impossible, you can't follow it for that far. Uh, some species like the fish owl, are, they're very, very shy. Uh, if, they can, if they sense that, they're, that a human is within 100, 150 yards, they, they, they fly off. And so uh, you don't want your behavior, like uh, your observations of, of the animals to influence how they're interacting with the landscape. So uh, we used a, 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 a common uh, methodology in, in wildlife uh, biology, uh, which is radio tracking. So you, you, you have to catch the bird, in our case, catch the fish owl, uh, put a transmitter of some kind on it in a way that doesn't impact how it, how, it, how it can fly or how it can feed or how it can breed, and then remotely observe that, observe that behavior, either um, at a distance of a few kilometers uh, using uh, radio uh, telemetry, uh, radio waves, or even further away using um, GPS. So uh, a, a unit might interact you know, with, with satellites in, in space and sort of collect uh, a database of, of, of where that animal went over a period of time. Uh, so um, uh, for those of us who have read the book, uh, your description of that makes it sound remarkably simple and, and easy to do. Yeah. And, and of course, as, as you know, it was it was not simple to do. Uh, but before we get into the challenges of actually capturing an owl, I wonder, could you sort of describe the landscape uh, of this uh, part of Russia? I know it's on the Sea of Japan. When I read the book, um, I actually went to Google Earth, so I was able to actually pinpoint some of the places that you were talking about. And when you zoom in on Google Earth, of course, it's beautiful and, uh, and uh, the trees are all full. Yeah. But you were there in, in the most inhospitable time of year. Uh, but maybe talk a little bit about the landscape, some of the challenges. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it really, it's a beautiful place. Uh, you know, it's like you said, it's right on the Sea of Japan. It's um, so the province Primorye, it's only about 1% of Russia's total land mass. Um, so it's a really, you know, it's a small little corner that's kind of tucked away. And you know, one side you have the Sea of Japan, the other side you have China, and in the south you have, you have North Korea. I mean, it's only, you know, it's fewer than 100 kilometers from, from the China border, and maybe, I don't know, 150 kilometers from the North Korea border. And it's uh, about 2 million people in the whole, in the whole place, in the whole province. Um, and in, in the, the county that, that the book takes place in, where most of my work is, uh, the, the human population density, it's something like um, you know, 1.2 people per, per square kilometer. 
Um, so very, very low population density. You know, there's uh, you know, around 10,000 people in, in a 20,000 square uh, uh, kilometer area. Very mountainous, uh, Sechate Aline Mountains. It's uh, somewhat similar to, to the Appalachians as far as um, how, how high they are. Um, and it's, it's a temperate zone. So it's at about 45 degrees latitude, the same as where I am now in, in Minneapolis. But there's this really interesting mixture of boreal species and subtropical species. And we have these you know, tigers and leopards and raccoon dogs and all these really exotic sounding things kind of uh, just meeting the northern extent of their global distributions in Primoria. And then these northern things like you know, wolves and lynx and, and brown bears you know, creep, creeping south and all sort of swirling in, this, in, in, a, in an oak forest. Um, it's really, it's really remarkable. And this is really, it's the only place in the world where you have brown bears and tigers in uh, living in the same forests. Um, uh, yeah, and, and the, I mean, the, the bird life is fantastic too. Just, uh, just really, really nice mixture of, of, of bird species there. So it's for, for a naturalist, anyone who likes nature, um, it's just a really, it's, it's a great spot. So I know from your description, the, the physical challenges that you encountered uh, because you were doing this research in the winter, you were racing against uh, the coming of spring, um, and you had some uh, some fits and starts about uh, how are you going to capture the birds, and maybe you can talk a, a little bit about some of the uh, early misses and uh, and then when you were able to actually to figure it out and how that happened and and who helped you do that and uh, then after that maybe we'll get to read that. Uh, that page that you and I discussed about the capture of the first owl. Yeah. So I think it's, it's important to understand, you know, early on, we understood that if we're going to be able to actually catch this bird who wants to have nothing to do with people and you, you, if you can't get, if you can't get within hundred yards or something, it's hard to catch it. Um, so we understood early on that winter was unfortunately, you know, the best time, our best chance to catch these birds, you know, because they eat, fish because they're aquatic prey specialists you know they uh they are very much tied to, to waterways to rivers and this is a part of the world where you know, it gets to the you know minus 20s fahrenheit easy uh in in winter so most water freezes at, at that temperature uh, but there are certain patches along um a, a waterway so within a fish owl's territory that remain unfrozen in winter um so you, you, there might be like a half dozen of these um out of you know, the, out of the many kilometers of river in a fish owl territory there might be you know, like, you know, a half dozen patches that are only you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 kilometer, uh, meters long uh, that the fish, can, uh, the fish owl can actually hunt in. And so that's really restricting um, where it can hunt and then kind of maximizing our chance of being able to catch it. So we already have an idea about where we can set our traps. Um, so the capture window is actually pretty small. Uh, it's, it's essentially, you know, February and, and March, largely, like that's, that's when uh, everything is, is, is as cold as, as, as it's going to be. The owls are breeding um, during, during that time. Um, fe February is, is the month where they're sort of courting. So they're more active the, the males hunting more because he's catching things and bringing it to, to her to show, to show her how, how what, a, what a great provider he is. So that when she's sitting on the nest in, you know, in early March, you know, throughout you know, March and in, into April, and relying on him to bring her food, um, you know, she knows that he's that he can do it. Um, and then, but by you know getting into April, that's when the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the snow starts to melt, the ice starts to melt, water levels rise, and so the capture season essentially ends um, in uh, usually in, in in April. So we have this limited amount of time to actually catch these birds, and you know we went over there really not knowing how. Um, you know, different, you know, as a, you're a, you're a raptor guy, you know, like, you know, uh, different traps work for different species. And you can't just go over there with, you know, a one size fits all raptor trap and think you're going to walk home with a fish owl. Um, it's, uh, you know, different, different species respond differently. So we went over there with a few different um, trap ideas. I consulted some raptor capture specialists here in the U.S. and just went over with different trap components and just kind of went out and, you know, tried to see what, what would work. And it was weeks and weeks and weeks of you know, living in a tent at, you know, you know again, you might, uh, re reaching the minus 20s Fahrenheit at night with no success. It would be uh, up all night, like hearing the owls vocalizing, you know, they're, they're hooting, we know they're there, 
but and we see there are tracks on the snow and the ice kind of near our traps, but they're not going into our traps. Then we're up all day, you know, poking at these things, wondering what we're doing wrong, like fiddling with them. Uh, so just this and, and cold the whole time. Uh, so there's this sort of this terrible cycle of uh, mm. of uh, unpleasantness uh, that 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 went on for a while. And I really, you know, I really started to, especially that first capture season. Um, you know, after several close calls with birds sort of getting trapped and then being able to escape before we were able to actually get them, um, really started to question what I was doing. You know, I mean, the, the whole research project depended on catching birds and we were just not catching birds. So you uh, re remind me, uh, it reminds me to uh, have you describe uh, how these owls actually hunt and uh, there, there are certainly different uh, strategies than uh, the, the owls that we're familiar with here in the, right. in the, in the Northeast, for instance, which so much of uh, it is done by uh, by hearing, um, uh -huh. and uh, some obviously snowy owls by sight. But uh, the, these birds don't hunt in anywhere similar to what uh, we would understand an owl uh, to be doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they um, it, uh, they they do rely. Uh, you know, most. Most owls have these facial discs, right? That, that channel sound directly to their ear holes. And fish owls, by and large, lack that. They don't, they don't have this facial disc. Um, so they, they really, they, they wait and they walk up and down the icy riverbanks um, in these open water patches, like looking for um, the right spot. And they'll just you know, kind of hunker down and, and watch the water. And typically it's at the riffle. So you know, on, on a river, uh, you've got, you know, uh, as, as a river flows along, you have a pool another pool and there's uh, there's the riffle is the shallow section that sort of uh, joins those pools. So as the fish who are happy in this pool and they want to move over over to this pool, they, they, they go through the riffle where they're exposed. Uh, in some cases, the water is so shallow, it's, it's 10 to 15 centimeters. In some cases, you know, the back of the fish is, is, is sticking out of the water. And, and that's when the owls jump in. And it's almost like, like watching a cat uh, you know, stalk, stalk something, they, you know, they hunch over, they sort of they wiggle a little bit. And then uh, they, they, when they jump in, they put out their, um, their they extend their talons uh, and they pull their wings back almost like an osprey does. And then, you know, plunk into, into just this absolutely shallow, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like watching, I think I, in, in the book, I say something like watching a, an Olympic diver jump into a kiddie pool. You know, it's, it's absurd. It's, it's this, all this, you know, formality and then boop, and just a little bit of water. Um, there are, you know, there's, um, there's, there's some fish owls in Japan and there's a, um, a fish owl researcher there who has described a whole variety of, of other hunting strategies by fish owls. So all my experiences are just in winter, uh, but he also describes like full on body dives, just like an osprey in, in, into deep water. But from my experience, it's always just these really almost comical, um, little jumps in the in the shallow water um so also the uh, uh the call the calling and the communication back and forth between the male and female and you talk about the duet um do you have a good uh, imitation uh, of uh yeah it's it's, it's pretty of a call yeah. yeah so it's it's a it's a four note call um and it's uh it's so synchronized that many people who hear it, even people who have lived in fish oil habitat and know what a fish oil sounds like, they, they wouldn't believe us when we, when we tell them that it was two birds. So it's, it's, a, it's call response, call response. So this, this will be the male, this will be the female. So it's a, uh, it's a ooh, 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 ooh. And they'll, they'll do that um, uh, you know, from up anywhere between five minutes to several hours um, in, 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 in an evening. Uh, so it's it's pretty it's pretty neat and it's and so uh, when when it's starting out the the male actually kind of bulges his throat out you have these white throat patches he bulges it out it looks almost like a bullfrog you've got this and it's almost like it's like this especially as as the light's starting to dim uh, it just looks like this sort of silvery orb and it's really a cue right? it's a visual cue right for for her uh, to know like all right you know you know the duet is impending and she you know, she responds immediately it's it's a, it's a really amazing. Um, uh, thing to watch. Um, so I know you have some images um, that maybe you could uh, share 
your screen, and, and maybe this would be a good time to read that uh, passage, uh, uh, which talks about the first, uh, uh, the first capture. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in, in in the in the section back about to read, which is about th uh, three three paragraphs, um, you know, this is kind of at, at the end of you know, Ser um, I'm with Sergey Abdiyuk, and we and we've been. Um, you know, trying for weeks to catch these birds without success. Um, and so we're, it's, it's the middle of the night and it's dark. We approached the trap a few hundred meters away on skis. Up ahead, I saw Sergei's spotlight reveal a fish owl sitting on the bank watching us. Like one of Jim Henson's darker creations, this was a goblin bird with mottled brown feathers puffed out, back hunched, and ear tufts erect and menacing. I'd seen other owl species adopt this posture in order to look bigger and more threatening to an aggressor. And it was working. This was a creature braced for battle. I was taken aback, as I still am every time I see one of these birds, by how enormous it was. The beast stood immobile, glaring at us with yellow eyes in the winter dark and illuminated unevenly by, by Sergei's light as our pace quickened. Everything was silent except for the rhythmic friction of skis on snow and our gasps of exhaustion. The urgency to reach the owl before it freed itself was palpable. My heart stopped as the fish owl pivoted and took to the air in retreat, but the weight of the noose carpet held and drew the bird softly back to ground. The huge owl moved away from us with awkward bounds along the broad snowy bank, dragging the noose carpet with it until finally, when we were only meters away, the raptor spun onto its back on the river's edge. It lay there facing us, talons extended and agape, ready to shred any flesh within striking distance. In the off season, I trained in raptor handling at the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota, and I'd learned that hesitation with a defensive raptor doesn't do anyone any good. I swooped my arm in a fluid motion the moment I was within reach, scooping the bird up by its extended wings, by extended legs. Upside down and confused, the owl relaxed its wings, and I used my free arm to tuck them first against its body, then the body against me as though holding a swaddled newborn child. The owl was ours. So that's uh, great imagery and, 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 and really uh, fun to read and actually fun to hear you uh, uh, read. The, uh, the goal uh, when you captured the owl, of course, was to uh, uh, take some, uh, some blood samples, et cetera, and weigh it and that type of thing, but also uh, to uh, put some technology. Uh, so maybe you could tell us uh, what was that technology and what was the goal of putting it on the birds? Yeah, so we actually, the first thing we did was um, actually uh, VHF transmitters, which is, you know, uh, so it's a unit that just kind of sends off a, ra a radio signal, like it was this beep, 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 beep. And then you can, um, if you have a, a, a special antenna that's tuned into that frequency, you can then, you know, triangulate the owl's location, um, essentially just to figure out where it is. Uh, and that's a, it's a reliable technology. It's relatively inexpensive, um, but it requires an antenna to work. And um, we caught four owls that first season and they ripped every single antenna off. Uh, which was really disheartening because it took forever, right, to catch these things. And there's like, boop, they just pull these things off so they're useless. So what we ended up doing uh, in future seasons was using uh, GPS data loggers. Uh, when these do not have an external antenna, um, there are a few. So and so the benefit is that it takes, you know, collects actually, you know, GPS locations. So very, uh, you know, um, accurate, you know, plus or minus five meter locations, which is, perfect for the type of work we were trying to do. Um, the downside, uh, first of all, is that we had to recapture the bird to, uh, to plug that thing in and, and download the data. And then they're also, you know, 10 times more expensive than, than the VHF ones. And so again, now I'm, I'm still writing grants for this work. Uh, and yes, it's easier to, to raise money for, for fish owls than it is for, uh, for Russian songbirds. These, the GPSs, these are like $2,000 each at the time. And, you know, so that's for, for a graduate student, you know, I would, I would put to, you know, I'd write a proposal and get one, you know, money for one of these things. 
And I remember, you know, the first bird we caught that way and put this GPS on its back and then sort of just let it go, you know, like hoping that at some point in the future we would see it again. Uh, you know, we had no way of, like, once it's, once we let go, it's gone. You know, we have no way of tracking it. Uh, and it's just kind of the hope that these birds are as territorial as we think they are, that they do live as long as we think they do. And they're, and it's going to be hunting in the same place in a year that it, that it was hunting now. Uh, and, and thankfully that, that sort of, <laughs> that, that worked. Um, yeah, we were able to recapture. to be true, right? Yeah. Yeah, we were able to recapture all, all the birds we caught that way. And there's another problem with with catching uh, any kind of animals. You know, some animals become what's called you know trap shy, where you catch it once and that's it. You know, you'll you'll never catch that bird again. Not 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 in that same way. Not in that same place. Uh, there's I've seen uh, some video footage of a of a tiger that is walking along this trail that is it, part of its territory. It's going to walk along this trail, and it kind of does this double take and then uh, leaves the trail, you know, kind of tromps through the deep snow to bypass this area, back to the trail, then goes on. And I asked one of my colleagues about that. He's like, oh yeah, we, we caught that tiger there a few years ago. So the tiger just uh, remembered that spot remember and goes that, out of its yeah. way to avoid it. And so we didn't know, like, would we catch these birds again? Uh, and, we, and thankfully it was, it was pretty easy. I mean, I think the, um, we used fish as lures uh, to kind of bring them in. And I think, uh, you know, there, there were birds that we caught every, every year uh, I mean, for four years uh, of these types of captures where, you know, I think the, especially toward the end of winter, you know, things are getting lean. Uh, it's, 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 it's hard for them to um, ignore a box of rising, writhing fish that we put in the river for them. Uh, so um, I was in just really taken with with, with the people that you worked with. Um, and uh, Sergey, of course, was extremely helpful in the, the whole design of uh, the fish can, you know, container, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about him, um, uh, Anatoly, uh, another really interesting person that you discovered in the woods. And then uh, after you uh, got very sympathetic to Katkoff, I, I began to appreciate him uh, more. So yeah, there are other characters, but those uh, three guys really play a prominent role in your work. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Sergei Avdeyuk, uh, I mentioned him earlier, you know, the, the brother-in-law of Sergei Stormich, this, this Russian Academy of Sciences uh, ornithologist. Um, Sergei Avdeyuk had been a, an engineer uh, in, in the Soviet times, so during the Soviet Union. And you know, like many industries, you know, where, where he, uh, you know, his, um, his job collapsed. So he lost his job, there was no money for it anymore. And he kind of pivoted, he'd always been an outdoorsman and, you know, in the, in the 1990s, you know, pivoted to the woods and never looked back. He sort of, you know, became this, um, this professional uh, woodsman, um, you know, leading expeditions uh, for Sergei Stormich. So, you know, Sergei Stormich would identify the species, the bird that they need to learn more about, and then task Sergei Avdeyuk with uh, doing all the field logistics. And so like, he was just incredibly important to, to this work. I mean, I definitely, um, you know, he was a you know, very much a collaborator and a field crew leader. Um, and just, you know, he understood, you know, not just how to fix vehicles, which I mean, these, these trucks were breaking down all the time. I mean, all the time. So he could just be, you know, uh, his, you know, he uses engineer skills to understand how, how things work and, and figure out problems. But just his, his intuition in, in the forest uh, was um, uh, in, incredibly helpful. You know, there were, uh, when, when the rains would start in spring, in spring for example, and we'd be, we'd be sort of camped next to this river, he would start to discreetly uh, you know, put these little sticks in the, in the soil uh, near the riverbank as gauges for when we needed to pack up camp and get out of there because floods were coming and we needed, we needed to go. Um, and so I, I legitimately feel like, you know, uh, it's with some hyperbole, of course, but I feel like I, I would probably still be in the Russian woods, you know, if not for him saying, okay, you know, we need to, we need to cross this river now. 
or, or we're not getting out. Or uh, yes, it's snowing now, but we have to make it across this mountain pass um, b- b- before it snows anymore, or otherwise we'll be stuck here for weeks. And and it always seemed to come true. Like we'd we'd get across this mountain pass and then find out that you know right behind us was a logging truck that didn't make it because the snow was too deep by the time it got there. Or you know. So just a really, uh, really useful person um, to, to, to be in the woods with. Now, Anatoly was a really bizarre character. Uh, well, I mean, he's a great guy. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. Um, uh, so he was a, he's a hermit. You know, he'd, he'd been living in the woods uh, for himself for about a decade. By the time, you know, uh, Sergei, during our first capture season, um, you know, we, Sergei and I would kind of spend our days wandering around just like trying to, enjoy life in any way we could because everything else is so miserable and Sergei ran into this guy along the river and uh he'd been uh uh Anatoly had been occupying this abandoned hydroelectric station that had uh powered this village about 20 kilometers down river uh during, during the second world war and he'd just been living there um and he you know he's very um he seemed very maladapted to life in the forest. I mean, so from his cabin, there were two trails, one to this uh, fishing hole on the river, the other to the outhouse. That was it. Like he didn't, he didn't really explore the woods. He, he, he made himself some skis, but they were out of two by fours and, you know, two by fours, you know, you can't, you can't really move too well in the woods and, and on, on snow if you have two by fours strapped to your feet. Um, and he had these, I think, you know, I don't know how much of it, uh, was because he'd lived in the forest alone for 10 years and how much he kind of brought to the woods with him. But he had, he had a lot of weird ideas about, about that place. Uh, you know, easy example is, uh, you know, his, his cabin was at the base of this mountain on the, on the edge of the, of the valley. And he was convinced that, that it was hollow. And all you had to do was dig down 10 meters and there'd be this water, this cave with this water source that was guarded by men in white robes. And he just sort of, you know, he just sort of, you know, whipped that out in the middle of conversation. And he, he didn't really know what to, what, uh, how to respond. Uh, but, you know, he, yeah, so what he did, so he invited Sergei and me to live with him. Um, Cause like his cabin just happened, it was at the confluence of these two rivers, which was almost like a natural border for these two uh, neighboring fish out pairs. And we, we were trying to catch both of them. And he's like, look, I've got a spare room in my cabin. I usually just kind of block it off in winter so I'm not wasting, uh, wasting firewood heating it, but I can open it up. You guys can live with me. Uh, and it was great because then we at least had a dry place and you know, he, was, he, had, he had nothing else going on, right? So um, he, he's like, I, I'd, I'd love, I'll, I'll cook for you, you know, whatever, whatever you want to eat. Uh, so we, we, we brought, you know, we'd go into town and buy, you know, buy all this stuff that he wanted us to buy. And then he'd cook all this food that he didn't really normally have access to anyway. So it was, it was really kind of a, it was a win-win all around. Um, um, and then, so uh, the, th- the third guy I'd mentioned was, was Andre Katkov, who was a, a field assistant who was, um, I'm, did, should, should I read this, this, this passage about Andre? Sure, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, and I will say, you know, but before I start reading uh, this thing about Katkov is, uh, you know, I, 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 I do like the guy. Um, I still, every time I go to Vladivostok now, uh, which is, you know, in a non-COVID year about, about uh, you know, once or twice a year, uh, I'll still meet up with Katkov for lunch or a beer or something. Um, so it might sound like a little bit like I'm throwing him under the bus, but he's a, he's a good guy. Okay. In his 50s and bearded, Andrei Katkov was stout with the paunch of a Roman hedonist. He showed up 12 hours late to Ternay. He'd driven the, his truck off the road on the pass and spent the night there cold and at an uncomfortable angle. Eventually, he flagged down a truck with a winch. I knew Katkov had been a police officer and was a seasoned parachutist, experiences that suggested discipline and stability, so I dismissed his rocky arrival as an anomaly. I'd come to learn, however, that Katkov viewed careening off an icy road as an unavoidable inconvenience inherent to driving. He engaged in this activity with surprising calmness and frequency, and in disregard for safety, there was a liability in the field. We'd been having enough trouble dealing with natural obstacles in our work, such as blizzards and floods. We didn't need self-manufactured problems as well. Katkov also had a challenging personality. Given his near pathological need to talk and the close field quarters, it was hard to feel at peace around him. 
perhaps most catastrophic, Katkov was a champion snorer. Everyone on the field crew snored, but he was a virtuoso. Whereas the rhythmic patterns of gasps and exhalations pr produced by an average snorer might eventually be acclimated to by co-sleepers, Katkov liked to keep those with an earshot in a heightened, heightened state of agitation with an astonishing range of pops, whistles, shrieks, and groans. Sleep was already a rare commodity in our work and restful slumber within any proximity of this man was almost impossible. Taken together, these traits made Katkov a difficult person to spend time in the field with. I was about to endure seven weeks in his close company. Well, you also go on to say how, uh, how great he was in the field and, and, and how uh, much he paid attention to detail and always accomplished the task that you need to accomplish. Yeah. And then you said he actually uh, got a job with, a, with an oil uh, company, uh, environmental compliance. I thought that was, a, that was terrific. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, uh, you know having someone as a coworker where you, you go from home to your job, interact, you know, you know maybe get a, get a drink after work, then go home is really different than living in a tiny truck in, uh, next to a river with you know, two to four other people in the middle of a Russian winter. So, I mean, sort of these right. uh, idiosyncrasies that you can, I think many of us can ignore uh, during normal interaction with coworkers were impossible to ignore in these situations. Um, so my, my biggest worry, to be honest, about uh, if this book ever were translated into Russian was, was how he would feel about reading some of these uh, passages. And, and I found out about a month ago that there is gonna be a Russian translation. So uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to cross that bridge when I get to it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so in, in your observations, you were also able to uh, bring video equipment out, which I thought was quite remarkable. Um, I know you had some issues, but, but generally you made it work. Uh, could you tell us what that might've contributed to your observations? Yeah, absolutely. And, and keep in mind, too, that we're in a very remote area. And so uh, any introducing any kind of electronics is, uh, is can be can be problematic. Uh, and so every bit of every camera we had uh, required its dedicated you know, car battery, essentially, to, uh, to, to, to charge it and to power it in the field. And so once we started using the video equipment uh, at, you know, where we'd be in blinds, you know, sort of watching and have a camera on a hunting spot or on a trap, so we'd know right when the birds would show up. Um, uh, then during, so that would be up all night. And then during the day, we'd have to you know trudge back to some central location, you know, carrying these heavy things um, to to a generator where we would charge them. And, you know, and at one point, you know, Katkov had had a had a battery explode uh, in his backpack uh, oh. as you as you. Thankfully, you know, he was wearing you know, a heavy coat. And yeah. it was a thick backpack, so he his it didn't reach his skin, but you know it, it, it ruined it, it destroyed his backpack. Uh, mm. So, uh, and one thing that we also hadn't realized was, I mean, the, the conditions were brutal for for for, for technology. Um, we would you know, we we would string cables you know twenty meters from the from where an owl was hunting, where we had concealed our blind, and you know you'd you'd step you'd step you. It almost seemed like you'd brush against it, uh, walking back to the blind, and and it would snap. You know, the cable would just snap like a twig in, in, in the cold. Uh, yeah. So then you have to uh, you know, go out and you know yeah. get it down and you know uh, splice it, put it back together. And so uh, it was really um, the equipment was very very helpful in allowing us to first of all observe fish owl behavior and understand how the traps were working because we, there's no way we'd be able to do it. Was, we were using infrared light, so they weren't impacting the bird. As far as the bird was concerned, it was just you know, this, this, this little red light. Otherwise, it was in darkness. So we were able to observe this natural hunting behavior, uh, and then also know um, when it was time to jump out of a jump out of the blind and go get the bird out of the trap. So like when, once the bird got caught in our trap, it was usually 20, 30 seconds uh, until we had the bird in hand. It was all, it was all very fast. So it was uh, pretty, as far as those things go, it was pretty, pretty safe for the birds. And I see we're pushing up on time. Um, so you learned a tremendous amount about uh, fish owl uh, behavior, uh, fish owl uh, 
resource need um, and you were able to put together a conservation plan and uh, maybe you could just explain a, a little bit about the data and the plan and the implementation. And I did notice when I was reading the end and, and the epilogue, a, a certain uh, bittersweet uh, to the conclusion. And uh, you know, I, I really felt that uh, you expressed that so beautifully, um, the end of a project uh, and then on to the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, so I, it turned out I mean, the fish owls really do have extremely specific habitat needs. And uh, for animals that uh, that do that, it's it's easier, I guess, in some ways to, to, to come up with very specific concrete recommendations because you know exactly what they need. I mean, these birds, they're only in river valleys. They're not going up the slopes ever. Um, they're always very close to the waterway. Um, and they need these really big trees to nest in. Um, and so uh, by, by, by <clears throat> isolating those specific areas on a, on a, on a map, so patches of old growth uh, cottonwoods, for example, uh, that, that, that these birds nest in, or uh, parts of the, of the river where there are these, um, where, where these multiple channels, um, that's where they're, that's where they're um, mostly where they're hunting. Um, so we're able to create a map that show these important areas and then uh, give that essentially to the uh, to the logging company that is logging in all these areas and is putting all these roads in. So there's not really a conflict between cutting down the trees um, uh, with the logging company, um, uh, but it is an, it is an issue where they put the roads in. Um, and so by sharing this information, by saying, okay, here's a river valley, this patch here, this patch there, this patch there, those are important for fish owls. We put these buffers of you know 150 meters around these these key areas. And say, don't put your roads there. And because fish owls are endangered in Russia, they're protected by law. So is their habitat. Um, and so before the logging company was given this information, they didn't have any. You know, they were kind of able to damage fish owl habitat because they didn't have a guide to follow. And now that they have this guide, they're legal, legally obligated to follow it. Um, so the valleys tend to be pretty wide. So now they know. Okay. We just won't put a road over there. We'll kind of put it put it over here, and it's you know. And by working just with this one logging company, I mean we're we're looking at uh, you know there's, um, oh, man, I don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's at least a hundred pairs of fish owls that 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 are that we believe are in the lands managed by this one logging company. Um, so it's 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 having a, a pretty big uh, pretty big impact. So um, Sandy reminds me that. We have a question and answer opportunity. Uh, okay. So, John, if, if you're ready, we'll uh, uh, we'll sure. we'll just uh, we'll just ask some. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the conservation culture in Russia, this part of Russia? How interested were the Russians in doing what was needed? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, there's not much of a conservation culture. I mean, we're something that my organization, the Wildlife Conservation Society, is trying to do is to is is, is to build that. Uh, we, we we run multiple trainings a year on on basic conservation practices to sort of you know, try to get get people more uh, more interested and more involved. Um, but I you know I do think that you know the situation with the fish owls and and the loggers uh, in Primoria in Tarrant County in Primoria is is unique uh, because of some uh, unique circumstances. Uh, so for example, so this, uh, this logging company I'm talking about, uh, one of the affiliates is based in this town, this village Amgu that I mentioned a bunch in the book. And there's 800 people that live there. I would say you know, the majority of the able-bodied men in Amgu are, 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 are loggers. They work for this company that's based there. Uh, the guy that runs it is was born in Amgu. He he fishes in in the rivers. He fishes off the coast. He hunts uh, he hunts deer. He, he hunts boar in the in the forest. Uh, he, he picnics in the forest, and so he understands what his roads are doing to, to, to the landscape. He knows that people drive those roads and, and poach. Um, and so, in fact, he was so I guess about halfway through the book. You know, Sergey and I, and I end up on the wrong side of an of a, of a, of a enormous pile of dirt that this guy is putting on one of these roads. 
Uh, so he's, he was already sort of bl he, he, uh, blocking access to, to some of these areas to prevent people from going up there and poaching. And so when we then went to him with this plan, like showing like, okay, these are, these are important areas here for fish owls. Um, uh, it sort of channeled his, his interest. It gave him, he wasn't so much scattershot closing roads. It's now, okay, now there's, there's more structure to, to how we can sort of protect these resources. You know, he, wants his, uh, he wants to be able to keep hunting there. He wants his, um, his kids to be hunting there. So it's all about you know, protecting, protecting the resources, making it sustainable. Um, and so, so I, I do think ask if you could, if you could put the pictures back up. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, as, I, as I, I can sort of, yeah, I, I can yeah. scroll through, through some of those yeah. um, as we. Uh, as and we uh, someone asks if you could uh, talk a little bit about the megafauna uh, that's uh, in this area as well. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's. I mean, there's tigers, right? I mean, it's it's hard. To, I mean, it's hard to get more megafauna than than, yeah. than tiger. Uh, it, it's you know, Tarrant County is uh, approximately ten percent. I mean, uh, ten percent of of the tigers and uh, of a moor, also called Siberian tigers in the world, are, are found here. Uh, you know, we run into their tracks all the time. Um, I didn't uh, for this work specifically. I didn't. I didn't see any tigers, but you know, there there are plenty of tigers that that saw me, there's, there's no, no question about that. Um, yeah. you know, they, tigers tend to avoid people here in, in Russia, other parts of tiger range, you know, Bangladesh, there are, you know, tig tigers tend to, tend to be attracted to, uh, to humans in the forest, but here they, mm. uh, in Russia, most people they run into are armed and some people shoot at the tigers. So they try to avoid them. Um, and yeah, there's bears, uh, Links. I mean, I mentioned some of these before. It's it's yep. a really really interesting mixture. So, uh, how is the owl population doing now? And are there trends up or down, or is it about the same? Um, well, we were able to. Um, there were thought to be about four hundred pairs total before we started this work, and we've. Um, uh, we think there's a lot more than that. We think four is, is kind of the low end of, of that scale. We think there's between 500 and 850 pairs or between 1,000 and 1,900 total. Um, I'm just gonna go to, a, go to a map just to sort of show you the, um, what we think of as, as fish out distribution. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but Primoria is down here. Uh, and then you can see this like really, really broad range going all the way up uh, Northeast Asia to the, to the Northern Sea of Ahosk. So fairly large area, uh, but at very low, very low population densities. So the owls uh, in Japan, uh, on, on Hokkaido, is that uh, the island that they're yep. on? Um, so someone wants to know uh, the difference between the, the species on the, on the mainland and the species on the island. Yeah. Have they diverged enough that one is a subspecies? What? Uh... Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, my, my Japanese colleagues uh, and, uh, and and Sormich and I, uh, you know, we we believe they should be split. I mean, it's it's currently one species, different subspecies, but um, the Japanese researchers have done genetic analyses, um, and they they think there's there's ample genetic evidence um, for for a split. <clears throat> this is a good picture showing the sort of the goblin bird pose, right? Um, yeah. And there are, and actually on this picture here, you can sort of see on the nape, on the back of the head is the white patch. So there, I mean, there are morphological differences or plumage differences. So this is the mainland birds have those white patches that the island birds don't. The island birds are darker. The duet is different. It's a three note call in, in Japan uh, and the, in the Russian Kuril Islands versus it's the four note call I mentioned uh, in, in Russia. So, I mean, I think they should be split, and I think, and that would that would instantly turn the Japanese birds into into a critically endangered because we're talking, you know, 100, 160, 180 birds total in that population. Um, so somebody wants to know what size fish do they catch? And uh, it depends on the time of year. Uh, I mean, they'll go. What I'm watching them catch is is pretty small. Um, uh, Masu salmon and Dolly Varden trout. So, you know, 15, 20 centimeters. But then during the salmon runs in autumn, there's the, the pink salmon um, and the chum salmon run. And, you know, it's you know, full, full size adult salmon. Mm. 
Oh, that's all I have, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, so here, here, here's a picture showing. So this is kind of a standard winter catch of uh, this is a masu salmon smolt. Uh huh. So not not very big, <clears throat> and you can see how shallow the water is, right? So imagine like this bird, you know, getting you know getting ready to like jump into the water and you know feed out, wings back, and then bloop <laughs> into, the, into a little bit of water. Um, so someone wants to know, did you keep a journal uh, during the course uh, of, uh, and, and, and then when you sat down to write the book, uh, you know, what was your, uh, what was your methodology? Yeah, so I mean, my, my field journals became the core of the book, I mean, no, no question. I, mean, I, put that, I put them all together. Um, and so, yes, this project, the work described in the book ended in 2010, and it was in 2016. Is it okay if I turn these off? Uh, it was in 2006, sure. yep. 2016 that I started to write the book. Um, so I put, I put all my notes together and right away ended up with, with a 40-page core of, of, the, of the book and then sort of expanded from, from there. And I'd never written anything like this, I've written a book. Uh, I don't. I don't have training as a as a writer, and so it, it took some work from my from my uh, my agent and then my editor um, to make it seem less like a field journal and more like a story, more like a book. So everything, all my chapters were, you know, chapters would start at the beginning of my day and end at the end of my day. You know, it was just this very you know field journaly, and so uh, they they helped sort of massage some of that and, and make it give it more of a, a, a larger narrative arc. Um, so uh, one of the comments is a fascinating, thank you. And, uh, and uh, John, I've enjoyed doing this and uh, appreciate uh, that uh, Sandy uh, asked me to do it. And I see it's 5.58 and uh, I think we stop at six. Is that right, Sandy? Yes. Um, and I, I just uh, briefly, there was one person who answered, asked a question at like five after five, which was, are you still studying owls and what will you be studying next? Will you return yeah, I, to Russia? Yeah, I, I do still study the I mean, owls. Uh, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's a small part of my overall job now. Um, I do, as, as Sandy mentioned in the introduction, Nick, I, I, I'm involved in bird work all across Asia from you know, the Russian Arctic and even, even Alaska down to, down to Southeast Asia. Um, but the fish owl stuff, it's, it's my, favorite, my favorite project. It's the most personally satisfying. Um, I, I just love it. So uh, the, the, the Sergeys and I, every year we're doing something. Um, I, think I was supposed to go out last year with them. They went without me because COVID. Uh, and there's, there's, there's plans for the Sergeys to go back out in May if we can, if we can get the funding to do so. But I'll, I'll probably have to miss out on this field season as well. Okay. And uh, there's a bunch of uh, other thank yous from people. Thank you for your work and for sharing it with us. Thank you, very informative. Thank you very much for your fascinating book and this uh, lecture. Yeah, my pleasure. Yes. I echo that sentiment. Thank you guys for doing this. It was it was way fun, and I think uh, I think we all we all want to find a an owl in our backyard, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although yeah. I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be a black custard owl, but you know. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you have a lot of owls in Minnesota? Yeah, a number of owls, and it's it's you know, funny. So, you know, some of the same ones that are in Primoria. You know, there's. Uh, um, you know, I saw I, I saw a great grand Primoria. There's a lot of great grays that, that tend to winter here in Minnesota. There's uh, short-eared owls, uh, long-eared owls. Um, snowies come down uh, here. They come down to Primoria. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch, a bunch of overlap. But then yeah. also weird things like northern bubuk. You know, this sort of uh, you know Australian uh, wintering owl that comes up to. Um, uh, to Primoria in the to mm. breed and, and, and you said you were at four, your latitude is forty five. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like where that, up around St. Albans, right, um, Charlie? Right. Just uh, just a quarter of a mile below the Canadian uh, mm. border in Vermont is the forty fifth parallel. 
Yeah. I always salute it when I go by because I'm halfway to the North Pole. So. <laughs> it was pretty great. All right. All right. Uh, Thank you, guys. And um, so our next event, uh, Friday, April 9th, we're going to continue with a, our travel fantasies in a different vein with author and former stewardess Ann Hood who will be in conversation with Julia Cook, who is a, a Woodstock author, actually, and her new book, yeah. Come Fly the World. Uh, it's an entertaining, insightful look into a, a glamorous area era of air travel back when there were meals and leg room can you imagine that <laughs> and pan am pan am world airways always attracted the kind of women who wanted to to, to get out and wanted up and all stewardesses who applied were required to have a college education speak two languages and put, possess the political savvy of a foreign service officer and a jet age stewardess serving on the iconic Pan Am between 1966 and 1975 also had to be between five foot three and five foot nine and weigh between 105 and 140 and had to be under 26 at the time they were hired. So, whoa. How the so, world has changed. It has yeah. indeed. Yeah. So everyone have a great week and get vaccinated and we'll see you next month. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Appreciate it. Bye. You take you take care. Thanks, Jerry.